Welcome back to Instant Replay Live. Joe is continuing to play Super Meat Boy. Just completed the first boss. Yep. We're carrying on. We're talking about Richmond. <laughs> and uh, in the break, Joe, you had brought up a little bit of a, a story you wanted me to expound on. So. Yeah. Uh, this is way back early when we first moved to Richmond. Uh, you were actually going to college here. Uh, you told me about oh, the homeless folks. I know who it folks. is. <laughs> in particular, so you talked to a couple of them and, you know... Uh, in particular, it was the story about the fashion police. Yes. Oh, my God. I could talk about this for, like, an hour, though. So I've got to try to condense it. So this is a just absolutely insane story. It's funny because Joe didn't want to tell me who it was he was going to bring up. He wanted to see if I could remember it sort of on the spot and organically. And, of course, I remember this. This guy has left a major imprint. He's not Richmond famous. He's not someone I've ever met anyone else who could talk about him who wasn't there the day that we met him. But he was this crazy guy. I, I can't say he was actually homeless. In fact, I dare say he probably wasn't because he um, he he had a shirt printed, custom printed, which I mean anyone could do, but um, custom printed with this very long-winded message on it um, that you couldn't read from afar. You had to get up close to actually read it. And I was walking to class one morning. I was running late because it was my first class of the day in college. And I um, saw the guy, very long, dreadlocked hair, older guy, which is already just, you know, kind of a weird thing to be around a college campus, and um, holding his shirt by the, like, by the waistline of his shirt so that he can outstretch it to get a good flat surface with his head down staring at his own shirt. And he was sort of locked in position, like, the entire time I had him in my periphery, he never moved. Um... I'm not telling the short version of this story, like I said. I need to speed it up. Yeah. <laughs> so I went to class, and the whole time, like, he was on my mind. Like, I wish I could have read his shirt. I want to know what that guy was about. And I came out of class, and he was gone. So I missed my opportunity. Until I met some friends for lunch that day in the cafeteria. And uh, while we were in the cafeteria, I looked out the window, and he had moved to be standing right in front of the cafeteria. So I was like, guys, we've got to eat quick because I've got to get out of here and see this guy. I don't want to miss him again. So um, very rapidly chomped down our food. No one else cares anywhere near as much as I do about this situation. Like, they're all just okay with me going and checking it out. They're not excited about it. So I go up and I walk up and I read the guy's shirt. The three friends that I was with kind of huddle together and just have their own conversation about 10, 15 feet away. And his shirt tells the story of the Fashion Police, a government organization which um, monitors lesser criminals, specifically drug dealers and addicts, um, to then use their crimes against them as... Uh, gosh, how do I even go into this without I don't want to I don't want to jump to the punchline because that that well, it's not really a punchline either I just I don't want to I don't want to jump to the, the big reveal um, basically just uses their crimes to leverage against them like hey we're not gonna send you to jail but you're gonna owe us and so the shirt left just enough information that I was really curious and like I said you have to be up close to read this because it was fine print so, like, I'm standing right next to the guy, and all I said at first was, like, hey, I just wanted to check out your shirt. Because clearly he wanted people to check out his shirt. So I said, so, you got to tell me more about this. There's, there's got to be more to this story. And he's like, oh, yeah, man, totally. Total, like, you know, Chong, <laughs> you know, from Cheech and Chong kind of voice and personality. Oh, yeah, man. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, man, totally. And, and so he um, goes on to explain... Pretty much what I just told you, with some added details about how, like, they enjoy using um, dealers in particular, because once they get a dealer, the favor that they'll ask for from the dealer is you have to give up your list of everyone you sell to, so that now they have a whole network of people that they can abuse with this. Um, they um, He also describes the men, the fashion police, as he calls them, in pastel blue suits, which is a very... A uh, different sort of government issue uniform than I'm used to, but pastel blue, the like, suit and tie, like, you know, FBI agent in a pastel blue, imagine that. 
Um, oh, and I, oh, I left out one major element of this guy's physical character. So I mentioned the dreadlocks, the shirt. He also has sunglasses on, but they are not at all like regular sunglasses, and I've never seen a pair like them to this day. I imagine they were custom, but they were very well, well made. They were designed by the government agency that it works for. Uh, I would say he, they were designed by the counter agency that he talks about, which I'll ah. get into in a moment. They are hard plastic, dense, uh, not see-through sunglasses, so that you cannot see his eyes, but little pinholes are made in the plastic lenses so that he can see out. Super creepy. So he goes on to tell this story, and, and at that point in the story, it's pretty much... He has told me a standard conspiracy theory, right? Like, he has given me nothing fantastic other than the pastel blue suits and the fact that these are secret, you know? This organization isn't a, a publicly acknowledged government organization. Standard conspiracy theory. But then the jump happens, and it is amazing. He says, see, the thing is, they also make you get, like, cleaned up. You can't, you know, wear dirty clothes. You have to cut your hair real short and nice. That's why we call them the fashion police, because they don't like people like me. Um, because that makes their magic not work. Their magic doesn't work on dirty people. <laughs> he says, see, if you've got hair like mine, and, like, grabs oh, a matted clump of dreadlocked hair, that blocks <laughs> their powers from getting you. But we have a different kind of magic. We've got a, you know, the, the magic that fights them. And he's talking literally about a sort of, like, almost D&D druid-like nature magic that they have that they can use to counter in this underground secret war the mind control powers of the fashion police. The more clean and organized your life, the more easily controlled you are. And that's why everyone who's in the resistance does drugs. Because that scatters your mind so that the fashion police cannot get their control over you. I am blown away at this point. I mean, I ask him every question I can think of about how they do this, how like <laughs> where they operate from. Yeah. Um, he describes the most amazing fantasy story to me in the modern day. Um, and I mean, I, he was so glad to tell his story to someone too. That right, was the other yeah. great because no one else was talking to him. But it was so crazy, and I mean, he he gave the impression that he wasn't just doing viral marketing, that he, like, genuinely believed in this stuff. I, we did have that idea, like, there must be a book or something, and that he's just, like, selling the concept, you know? Right. But I didn't care. I wanted to know all about it. It was so incredible uh, to meet someone who didn't seem dangerous. Uh, he just seemed well, into his idea. Yeah. I have met, sadly, a couple of dangerous people um, who have crazy ideas. Um, to tell a much less fun story, I met a guy who was convinced. He, he sat down to me next to, the, uh, next to me at the bus stop and told me, Man, I got a story. And I was like, wow, all right, uh, let's hear it. And he said, this story is going to blow up the world. It's going to be huge. It's going to be the biggest thing in the newspaper. And it was right around the time of the uh, Michael Vick dogfighting case. Because yeah. uh, that was that trial was here in Richmond. Um, and he's like, it's going to be so much bigger than that. It's going to make that look like nothing. And I'm like, all right, dude, you got to tell me. <laughs> and he said, there is a coven of witches running this city. Oh. Now, this poor guy was deranged and possibly dangerous. I was really worried. Um, he goes on to say that his wife and daughter have turned against him because witches got in their heads and they told the police he was going to oh, hurt man. them. Um, but it was all lies and he didn't do anything. And he's building his case and his evidence, and he's going to take it to the newspaper, and it's going to be huge. And I just felt so bad for the guy. I, I didn't try to encourage him, but I also didn't try to stop him or make him feel bad, because, first of all, you know, he, he could have been dangerous. I didn't yeah. want to have anything happen to me, but I also didn't want to set him off for someone else or make him just even feel bad, you know? Um, poor guy. Definitely needed medical help. But uh, equally as crazy story as the um, as the uh, the fashion police and and those kinds of tales I have always wanted to like write an urban gothic mm. fiction you know so in did Richmond they, did they overthrow the witch coven 
I'd I'd like to believe yes. <laughs> I'd like it never made it to the news because Hellboy of course, got in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, but man, uh, the the fashion police that um, there was a guy who once um, was carrying a two by four down the street and said he was off to kick some ass. <laughs> um, and uh, genuinely seemed like you know, that might happen too. Um, there's some crazy stuff that happens if you just hang out on the streets of Richmond and you know take a bus ride. Just take yeah. a couple bus rides, and some weird stuff goes on. <sighs> Anyhow, those are my the tales of Richmond as as uh, visualized by Super Meat Boy. Yeah, right. We didn't talk about the game once, did we? Uh, I don't think. Well, I mean, briefly when we started. But... Did we? Okay. All right. Oh, All right, cool. well, uh, thanks for watching. I hope you have enjoyed these tales, and if you have any of your own Richmond stories, or if you want to hear more, let us know in the comments. We got to start the next one.